Thank you all. Uh, so yeah, I, we're going to talk a little bit about, Danny said, the Walt Disney Pavilion at Florida Hospital and kind of some of our thoughts behind that and relating to childhood and everything. So uh, we could we'll move forward here. I um, want to go again. Uh, so as you said, Imagineering, that's where I am. And so that's the creative and design arm of Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. So based out in Glendale, California, but we have probably our second, maybe now third largest branch here in Orlando with about 325, 340 people here. Reason I say maybe third is Shanghai is coming up right on its heels and we probably have more people now in Shanghai building our new resort out there. Uh, if you want to move ahead, uh, jump again. So I am project manager and show producer. And some of my projects that I've worked on, as Danny said, was last year we did a refresh of Big Thunder Mountain, the Magic Kingdom, and so a whole new queue experience and interactives. And so I was uh, the lead on that one. Uh, if you want to go ahead and go forward. Uh, I also just came off the heels of Jingle Cruise, which is a holiday overlay of the Jungle Cruise. So all those puns everyone knows and loves, we did a Christmas and holiday spin on it to make it even more of kind of sometimes a groaner. Um, and then also did One Man's Dream, an exhibit at Disney's Hollywood Studios, uh, which really celebrates the life of Walt Disney. And so we updated that exhibit. So those are some three recent exhibits or projects that I've done, but have done many more over the past eight years. And I've been with Disney about 10 years total. Um, and actually, two of these projects were great for me because I started at Big Thunder Mountain in operations and then was also a Jungle Cruise skipper at Disneyland. So to come full circle and then get to actually build and work on those was a lot of fun. So uh, if we go uh, forward and kind of think about childhood and then Disney, these are the type of images you usually kind of come to mind. You think kids playing in the parks with our characters, pixie dust and castles and all of that fun stuff they kind of think of with the Disney brand. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, but how it applies to some of these other projects. So a little bit of a spin. And if really one thing you don't think about is a hospital, kind of a clean, cold hospital. So this one here is Florida Hospital, just down I-4 here. Um, and something, again, don't affiliate with Disney. About five years ago or so, partnered with them to bring the Walt Disney Pavilion to life uh, just adjoining this. So, the left of this picture, you'll see um, this here, which was built at that time. So, we have worked with Florida Hospital for probably 20, 25 years in different capacities. Um, they work and manage our first aid centers at the parks. Um, we also have brought characters and folks down to the hospital, but it was really a time of thinking about what could we do to kind of take this to the next level. And they were getting ready to expand with uh, this new children's hospital. They'd always had a children's hospital presence but wanted to take it farther. And so came to us. And so that was when we uh, kind of did naming rights and partnered with them for it. Um, so as we dove into that, we thought, what is it that's different between hospital and theme park design? And then specifically, how does that relate to who's the user of both of those places? So what are the goals? Uh, what's kind of the vocabulary, both from a just physically, how does it operate, and how do you describe and use the space, kind of the design vernacular, um, safety requirements, all of that that goes along. And you think of that with a hospital, maybe not as much with a theme park, and then maintenance. But at the end of it, it was all still for families and children. So that was really what it was all about. Both, whatever one we were designing, it was all about keeping it for the kids, really. Um, and we kind of, I'll say here, we kind of joked during our project team, we said our parks, it's for the kids, and here it was for the sick kids. Because we a lot of this was like trying to get 
donations and people's time as we were doing this project. And so we were trying to like, remind everybody why we were doing this project and wanted to kind of keep that innocence of childhood going as you're at the hospital. Something that you're in here, it's a scary place, you don't know what's going on. And so how could we keep that innocence and let kids be kids while they're in there getting treatment or maybe their siblings are in there and they can't do anything but just sit and watch TV or sit and look at a wall sometimes, nothing else. Um, so uh, what we started to do, again, this is kind of what you think of when you think of a hospital. And this is one of their rooms too. Um, so nicer than a lot of them, but still very kind of just cold, stark, clean. Um, and what could we do to just take that to the next level? And we really then focused on specific area, which was um, the lobby of the space. And so this image here was our first kind of sketch that we did internally for it. And we tried to think, what is it that kind of Disney brings to things? What is it that kids might want to experience? And a big part of it was nature. And so we really wanted to focus on kind of the healing powers and calming sense of nature. And so that's, we felt because of this inherent universal qualities that everyone could understand and just bring to the space. But then how do we do a Disney twist on that? And so wanted to then look at other movies uh, that we have. So then what are those movies that drive nature to it? Um, we then brought The Lion King, Jungle Book, uh, Little Mermaid, and Brother Bear to this space. So all of these, this, actually this piece of artwork is the first public piece that we released when we announced the project that went out to media. Um, but all of this is really tying that nature together and trying to figure out how to use that to kind of instill that nurturing sense and also cho chose characters from those movies um, that for the most part were the supporting cast. We wanted the kids to be the focus. It's all about the kids at the hospital, the service, the focus of whatever it might be. And so these characters are the supporting cast from the movies here to support the children on their story of what's happening in the hospital or their journey um, for whatever reason that they're there. And so that was a kind of a secondary story that we told throughout the space. Don't directly tell it, but it's just kind of implied as you experience it. Um, so we went from this image here to then uh, really kind of how do we bring it to life. So this is some of our teams installing the characters in the space uh, that you can see out there today. It's Timon and Pumbaa and Simba. Uh, to then what there is now today. So this is what, if you walked out into the lobby, into the space, here's what you're greeted with. So that kind of iconic scene from Lion King with them walking across the log, and then reinterpret that into the space. Uh, as I said, is really how do we bring some of our design principles from the parks to a hospital lobby? Maybe not on the surface as obvious and of a connection, but really as we dove into it, it is all the same, it's just how you apply those. So we, one of our big things that we have in Imagineering, and you can actually Google and see all of them, is what we call Mickey's Ten Commandments. And so these are kind of principles that uh, Marty Sklar, who was uh, with Imagineering uh, from its inception date almost, he wrote for Disney and was a speechwriter for Walt Disney, um, and really retired a couple years ago. But he wrote these ten principles that we still use today and kind of just ingrained in our culture. Um, things like just knowing your audience, know what you're, why you're doing this and who you're playing to. That's obviously a big part of this here. Um, one of them, and I'm gonna butcher this how it's exactly said, but it's kind of create a visual weenie, something to draw you to. So if you think of the castle at Magic Kingdom, that's that visual weenie that you enter the park, you see it, you wanna go to that place. And so we did that here, you come in and as you're greeted, this is your entrance, you see Baloo back there, you see it, and you kind of get this moment, and you want to pull back and go into it. So those are the type of things that we really thought about as we tried to bring this space to life. So I'm going to jump around a little bit as we talk about this project specifically and how it all, different aspects of it, and kind of relating to the kids specifically or just bringing it to life. Uh, one of the pieces that I'm showing here is actually artwork 
from or inspired by or characters from It's a Small World. So again, another, when you think of kind of kids in Disney, that's another classic one from the 1964 World's Fair in New York. And so uh, very simple, clean designs for the most part. And as Mary Blair was the artist for these and has influenced many people since then, a lot of our artists and people internally. Um, and so we wanted to see how could we incorporate that style into this, but on the surface, again, does not really work with Simba and Baloo standing there in this jungle setting. How do we bring these together? And so we tried to struggle with what that would be. Um, and so we then created um, the Walt Disney Pavilion logo. And so we created this internally. You've probably seen this on billboards on I-4. They have it on their ambulances, their uniforms. This logo is plastered on everything now. But this was really inspired by Mary Blair and that small world style and kind of that innocence and sweetness that inherently came with that wanted to bring that into um, another aspect of the hospital. So this logo reaches far beyond that lobby, but it also has that kind of quintessential innocence to it that we wanted to convey. At the bottom, and this is a little hard to see, but if you go and just Google Florida Ho our Children's Hospital's logos, you get a huge variety of logos, and I pulled just four of them here. For, to be a, at a super high level, a lot of them are primary colors, very, uh, almost look like a child drew it, it's kind of that crayon look. Um, pretty simple logos. I mean, I know a lot of thought and effort was put into these, but it's kind of that child did the logo type feel. Um, we wanted to differentiate it from that and push it a little more sophisticated and stand out from those, but still fit in the vernacular of children's hospital logos. So like so many of these, you have kids standing there, hands up, we have that same type of thing, but we just pushed it. We said we're not going to just do red, yellow, and blue as our colors and call it a day. Like We just wanted to push a little bit farther uh, with it. And so this is where, this was our result here. And so it was one of our artists, um, Josh Holtzclaw, who's now actually works for Leica Animation in Portland, did this logo here. Uh, so jumping again to another topic, um, thinking about the space, what would the kids actually do in the what did they kind of fill their time with to take their minds off of what's happening and just play, be kids? Um, we want them to be able to run around, enjoy themselves, parents to sit back and just watch what's happening, or even send their kids down to play on their own. And so these are some first kind of sketches, storyboards that we did for the space. Within each area, we have um, really kind of interact as if you will, like you play. So when you go into uh, Brother Bear on this upper left hand side, this is the first concept what we call the salmon run. So as you go, you guys have seen this probably in airports or other places where uh, IR readers, where you can go and kind of reach for it and it looks like you're grabbing the salmon, but because it reads your hand and a fish will always swim away. You're never gonna grab that salmon who's gonna swim away from you. So they could stand there for two seconds or 20 minutes and never catch that salmon. It's always swimming around. Um, we have in the Jungle Book, that movie is a lot about music, is one of the things that comes to mind. And so we created a, uh, you see a little kid playing with it, these jewels on the wall. You can touch some of the stones and they light up in musical notes. So we have eight notes, so you could sit there and play music if you wanted to. Again, touch it once, oh, great, it lit up and keep moving, or try and play some piece. Um, and then uh, these are just three of them, but then in Lion King, if you think in the movie, Rafiki is, draws a little symbol of Simba inside of his tree. Uh, we recreated some of that and additional pieces on the wall, but if you go and touch them or kind of reenact almost like what Rafiki does when he draws it, they light up with fiber optics. And so this little music and additional ones that are hidden light up in the space. A big part of these three and the others were to really provide, as I kind of alluded to and talked about, kids a chance to play with something for two minutes or 20 minutes so they could spend as little or as much time as they wanted. There's really only one of these games that has a 
ending that you can win or beat. These are really kind of infinite loop type things that you can just play forever. And that was done on purpose to let really not age it out for anybody because this children's hospital was for infants to up to 18 we wanted to try and have a little bit of something for everybody and if it was so simple to beat your teenagers aren't going to care to come down there but if it is too hard why play it so we did one that i'll show you in a little bit that does have a kind of beginning and end if you will uh, so we move forward and you saw those sketches. This was really one of the next steps after we had kind of settled on what this would be. We did elevations of the entire space to really figure out the size and how it would all work in the space. So if you go out there, it's a three-story atrium, and it's actually not much bigger probably than this space if you took these two conference rooms and offices. That's about it, if that big. So it's not big, it's a big vertical space. So we really wanted to fill it but not make it overwhelming for kids. Um, they're already having this overwhelming experience in the hospital, no need to just kind of do it even more and just overload their senses. You're still probably gonna be somewhat overloaded with your senses in here, but really make it calm and comforting with the characters, with just the overall feel at their scale so that they feel like it's their spot. They can kind of own it while they're there. So again, these were elevations that one of our designers did of the Lion King area and then Ariel's grotto. So a little cave. Um, if you think of the movie, her grotto with all her uh, knickknacks and trinkets that she's collected, we have a little miniature version of that as well. And our next step was to confirm that we felt okay with making it safe for kids, sized right for kids. We had a one inch scale foam model that the entire lobby was made from. So we could sit there with our scale people and kids and think about, is this somewhere that we think they could climb on? Is this feel right and what would it be? So this is kind of one shot of that foam model. That was probably about half the size of this table, if you will. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we then physically built the entire thing in wire cages that are the infrastructure out on Disney property. So that take a, took us one more level to be able to really check, is this all correct as we built and did this? Do we get our sight lines right to meet those kind of 10 commandments, uh, uh, some of those rules? Can kids just physically reach it again? You can only do so much at that small model scale. And so this was here um, in a yard where actually 40 years ago they built all the monorail beams and it's kind of there and we physically built the entire thing and could walk through it all. And we then, these are probably a little hard to see, but that entire cage um, was built and then cut into pieces that could fit through a double door and then shipped downtown. And so individually, each, each piece was cut, marked, and brought in one by one, because at that point, the walls had been enclosed in this space. The hospital was building the lobby, and we were finishing out the inside. And load it in, rebuild it there, reconfirm confirm that it all fits, and start plastering it together. So all the rock work on there, you have it mostly formed out, because um, what we do is you take that foam model and they can scan the entire thing, and then it bends most of your rebar by machines and by hand, put that together, and then uh, hand carve all of the concrete rock work on the surface there. So again, if we wanted to, you know, needs an additional rock here or there, we could have them carve it or take a physical rock and from a gravel yard and just stick it in there and be part of it as well. So that's what those two pictures show. And if you jump forward again, here's some of the finished look as well. So on the left is the Jungle Book area, and you can see the jewel tone area that you can play music on, and King Louis' throne. So we reference the movie heavily for all of this. So if you go and watch The Jungle Book and see his throne, that's it right there. But this again is at kid's scale. So a kid can sit, at, the seat is probably about 10 inches off the ground, maybe a slightly higher if that. So a kid can really sit there and kind of feel like they're ruling that spot. Uh, and then two not as well-known characters, Rut and Took from Brother Bear. And so they're the Canadian moose who wisecrack the whole time in the movie. And so we have them up there kind of watching over everything as well. 
And then we have our Ariel's Grotto that I talked about. So this one is you go back into this. This is kind of the farthest point. It's kind of the most intimate, darker spot. This photo doesn't really look dark with its flash. But you go back into it and explore the space, and you see her grotto behind this little piece of glass that's here. But on that glass, you have bubbles that are floating up. So as kids want to touch those bubbles, they pop. And you might have a little um, starfish or seahorse swim away. And then every once in a while, if you've popped enough, this big kind of crab creature rises from there and burps and a bunch of bubbles and come out as well. It's kind of this unexpected moment. But again, no beginning, middle, and end. Kids can just stand there and play it. And it's always going to be a little bit different depending on what they pop. But it, the idea is trying to make it look like these bubbles are floating in space because behind it is all of her trinkets that she's collected um, through her life. And we'll go forward again. So one of them specifically that I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail on was what we called the grub grab in the Lion King area. So um, Timon and Pumbaa are always talking about their grubs and bugs that they want to eat, and we wanted to try and represent that somehow. Um, and plus, as always, we joke that kids are grubby and dirty and whatnot, so what can we do there? Uh, the first idea that this image shows were we wanted bugs that kids could literally pick up, play with, and maybe they were Velcro and stick onto a wall and move around with. Sounds great in theory, but think about kids at home and playing with stuff. Things get lost, things get dirty. In a hospital, two things you do not want to have happen. So especially the dirty part. They need everything to be cleaned. It has to have, be able to be cleaned with bleach or a bleach alternative to disinfect the entire space. So that drove a lot of our decisions too. So immediately, almost anything fabric, reusable fabric type stuff is out to some extent. So we said, what could we do that still had the bugs involved? And we also needed something that aged up a little bit, that had that beginning, middle, and end. And so we turned, we went to kind of a basic game, the game of Simon. So you guys all know that game. Really, we created a Simon game with the bugs and wanted to let kids play with it. So again, if you're two years old coming up to it, it makes, it lights up and there's sounds that's enough. That's fun. I mean, that is like, again, it's kind of the cardboard box that the box of the present came in. That's exciting. That's fun. Um, but for the 12-year-old, they can keep playing Simon and keep, try and get all the way to the end. So this is kind of the development of that. So once we did that, we thought, how does that all work? How many buttons do we want to have? Is it just the four like Simon? Do we want more? What's the height? What's the size? So we started sketching what that would be. How do we make that all work together and really think about it at a kid's height, again, down at their level. And it's probably about 18 inches or so off the ground. Um, then we took that to the next level and built a full mock-up that literally, this is one of our conference rooms, that we had this box, got our buttons and programming and did this whole thing and had our guys, and some, we got some of our Imagineers kids to come in and play it as well. How many times did it take to then be able to beat it? Was it five times, five rounds, and that was e too easy? Was it 15? Where did we land? I think we were about eight to 10, somewhere in that, where once you got to eight or 10 kind of sequences, it was just challenging enough to be like, okay, I beat something. This was rewarding, but not frustrating. So it probably is frustrating for some, but that was kind of our threshold. But we built this full mock-up to be able to do all the programming and testing beforehand so that we didn't have to sit there in the lobby and tweak things out there with kids. We want it to be done out on site. So we do this type of thing for many of our activities, attractions, interactives across property, Disney, but this was a specific one to this here. Uh, so from there, uh, you think, okay, a simple Simon game, it's not hard to run. These are two photos of the infrastructure just to run all these interactives, some fiber optics that turn on. So we joke, this is before the foundation was poured that a dump truck just poured conduits out into there. So you can see these trenches with dozens of conduits, literally is just running um, fiber optic and um, power and different low voltage cables to run these shows. 
uh, along with then behind the scenes, behind that rock work, this is probably about half of the stuff that runs those grub grabs. We then have a full, uh, what we call internally on Disney, a um, EER room, an electronics and engineering room, or electronic equipment room that has all the servers and equipment and power and breakers that run everything. These are heavily air conditioned, clean closets, basically. If you say EER at the hospital, you think ER, emergency room. So that was part of what I said earlier on the language of understanding and working with them. But we had to build a whole space to run this entire lobby and have everything keep going and working and train them in how to do that because they know how to keep a CAT scan machine going and dip what all their equipment. This, totally foreign to them. No clue how to do this. But again, totally different world that we're introducing into their space as well. So from that, we started to, what do we make those bugs actually look like? We didn't want those buttons that you saw in the mock-up. That was purely just a test, a touching thing. So we wanted to pull directly from the movie those bugs that you know and you see in the movie. So sculpting them, but also thought about hand size for kids. We wanted them to be easy enough to push in. What is something that a small kid could again depress? Not something so big that it's out of scale. Uh, also, again, just large enough to have presence in the space. Um, the pressure that you touch these bugs with was a big thing because we found that some kids would just tap it and nothing would happen or some would literally smash it. So as again, as you'd expect, uh, they'll do anything. It's stuff you'd never plan for and expect, just like any child would do. Uh, so we then move forward. This is a close-up of that shot I showed before, building it out on Disney property. At this stage, we had the full kind of mock-up with our boxes in there, knowing kind of where the buttons would go. We changed a few things at this stage because of the, the angles that it was all at. We wanted it to kind of be the surface, but angle up a little bit. So at this point, we could really tweak and adjust stuff, and we weren't locked into anything. But again, really trying to think, how would this work for a kid? We didn't bring any toddlers out to the construction site to test it, but we really tried to tweak things there to make it that end product better. Um, here's a site kind of right before it's installed at the bottom hole there is where it would go in eventually, that shot you saw before, within those red pieces being some additional bugs that are kind of climbing up and away from the wall. Within our final installation there, so you can see the bottom left yellow green one lighting up. And as I said, stuff that you would not expect, this is an official kind of Florida hospital publicity photo, kids climbing on everything. So we get that at the parks, we try and plan for it, you try and plan for it at home, anything when you have kids around. But we did not expect, which in hindsight we should have, building something at 18 inches high lets kids stand on it and not use their hands to do it. They stomp on the bugs. And so that was a big kind of learning thing of like, oh, yeah, OK. Um, so that happened a lot. Bugs would crack and break. Um, so that was something that we always had to work through. And so again, not surprising, these photos were taken before it even officially opened. And they kind of brought the ringers in of like, here's some kids. We're going to take some photos, play. This is what happened. You also see a kid hanging from blue over here. <laughs> um, so not, again, unexpected. And we, we expected that with the characters. Um, blue and Flounder and Sebastian are the three that you can actually get to. They probably have more steel in those structures than some houses do, I would bet. Um, they are fully reinforced. His fins are just sheets of metal just with fiberglass coating them so that it doesn't crack or break. So we expected that one. Um, what we're seeing actually now, and one of the things I'm working on, is they're hanging on it so much that the paint is wearing off. So like the, there's a spot where kids climb up and sit on flounder. Again, would have never really expected that, but we should have. Um, you can see exactly where they sit and where the paint is just rubbing off on this kind of seam right there. And so uh, those are the type of things that you find out. And we know from the parks, you see a lot of wear and tear. But we did not know what to expect here. Um, we 
at the parks, you get tens of thousands of people running through it a day. So we hear the hospital had no idea. We could not, we tried to do our best guesses, and it's probably dozens, hundreds a day maybe, but it could be nobody in there for 30 minutes, and then you have 20 kids in there at once, and this like weird flow where we had to really get out of that mindset. We were super structured about, okay, you're gonna have X number of people per hour, they're gonna ride through at this rate, you're gonna get to here, you're gonna do this, we expect this many people to buy hamburgers and sit here, like it's super structured even though it might not appear to be, everything is planned out to like nth degree. Here, when the hospital couldn't give us those answers, we were kind of thrown for a loop. It's kind of like, uh, what do we do? Um, and so we had to kind of just leap of faith with some of this and see what would happen. But again, realizing it's a lot of the same principles, same things that apply to the parks. Kids are kids, people are people, wherever they are, they do the same things and want some of those same things. Um, so again, some more photos of kind of that finished product. And you see people here, the kids here, trying to activate the fiber optics with their feet. So trying to put that up there. Um, so you'd see a little of everything happen out there and really, to the, for the most part, tried to um, protect things as best as we can. And happy to say it's now been open almost four years officially, and it's probably seen about as much wear as we see in our parks in a month to two months, maybe. Just the numbers of people that run through there, um, and everything's holding up pretty well. So we're happy with it, the hospital's happy with it, but again, it's those unknowns like any project that you just can't fully account for. Um, so that's kind of quick level, high level story of the Florida hospital. I have many more, but open it up to any questions and talk some more. How so. long was the whole span of time? Uh, we started in 2008. Oh yeah, sorry. So the question is, uh, how long was the span of the project? How long did it take? We opened up in March of 2010 and started probably in 2008 summer, fall of 2008, we really started kind of thinking about it. And probably before that, for months to a year, was the kind of negotiations and discussions about the overall sponsorship. Um, and the project, we finished actually, construction heavily started early 2009, uh, late eight, early nine. And we finished fall of nine, but it did not really open up to the public until March. So it sat there for several months, just kind of there but we were done in probably about 10 months. Yeah. Yeah. How big is the project team? Uh, so how big was the project team? We were probably about 20 people total, uh, but nobody full time. So this was a about, probably about half to three quarters time project for me, about half time. I was doing other projects at the same time from, and probably about two other people at that same level. Everyone else it was quarter time, eighth time. And we really, because of what this project was, wanted it to be kind of a, uh, the passion for it. And we wanted people from our teams that really wanted to be part of it and give their time. So even though it was a formal project, a lot of people, we didn't charge to it necessarily in our, and all of that. It was just what we wanted to do. And we worked with outside uh, vendors and our contractors for donations and stuff like that too. Saying again, reminding everybody, it's a donation to the hospital, not a donation to Disney. So, yeah. yeah. So you have some sight lines and stuff there for with the kids and the adults and stuff. Where do you get those averages and stuff? And use them within all your queues around the park as well. Uh, so, looking at um, kind of what are those? Where do we get the averages for heights and sight lines and stuff like that? And we probably. I honestly don't know if we have exact data. I don't know offhand. Um, we kind of, some of it's inherent, some of it's we bring certain kids in. Um, we just, I think some of it, we know where certain heights should be with walls and reach envelopes and where wheelchairs go in, where some of that you do have very specific things to go. So we knew we needed 48 inches, 40, 48 inches to turn around a wheelchair in space. And so those are the type of things that are, some of it's set by code and some of it's standards that Disney has as applied to it as well. And I say that and there might be stuff that there's something out there that formally, but a lot of it, because every project is different, depends, yeah. Um, did you collaborate with any other design companies? Did you talk about that process? 
Yeah, so uh, we did collaborate with some other design companies with this. Um, mostly it was the companies that Florida Hospital had already brought on board for their bigger project. They, um, if you guys are down there at all now, there's still tons of expansion and building going down there. So they had um, Hunt and Brady Architects, and I forget who their interior design group was. Uh, it's through Hunt and Brady. They, we partnered with them. So we didn't really bring in any other outside people through ourselves because they had them. They were the contractor, they had their general contractor. We used our interior designers, but would partner with them to then um, influence some of the outer spaces. So this lobby that you guys saw here, this kind of lobby proper, if you will, was truly done by Disney, um, built hand in hand. We did all the kind of show pieces with their facility contractor doing the building, the shell of it, if you will. And then we helped uh, work with them and consult with their interior designer teams and graphic designers for graphics on the floors above and the adjoining spaces and lobbies, all the other public spaces. Because one thing that they did and was a big part of this was take these four themes and kind of push it up to the floors. So you have a jungle-themed floor, a savanna-themed floor, mountains and whatnot. And so we, they did passes at it and we would just kind of review and take part of that, but really let them take the lead. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how would I take anything back that I learned from this project to future projects? Um, yes, I'm sure there is. I'm trying to think offhand right now. Um, every project that we do is entirely different. I mean, that sounds kind of a cliche, and I think goes the case for many of you guys here. But this one, I think it, it just opened our eyes again about who, how guests experience it. I mean, we're always thinking about that. What's that guest experience? What's that story? What does that impact? But here we had much more of a direct impact and was feeling back to us kind of that gratification of why we're doing this. Because when we can get a little bit removed from it with, again, any job you can get removed from why you're doing it or see people react to it. And here, we brought in the Florida Hospital executives when it was still under construction. I mean, it was rebar, plaster, and lath, and they started basically crying right there, literally. And so we, it made us like, okay, this is, we knew we were doing something cool, but it helped just reinforce that for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the question is how do we estimate and kind of plan our costs for this project? We, there was a bigger negotiations with Walt Disney World and the Disney Company as a whole for this higher sponsorship of uh, this new children's hospital that I was not part of and neither was Imagineering. Um, part of that was, hey, we'll get Imagineering to do something. Um, so they had their, what their entire donation was, kind of cash and in, in kind total amount, and a certain chunk of that applied to the lobby. We um, had that number, we came up with the design, and like many projects, we dreamed much bigger than what the budget was. Um, more than double what the budget was. So we had to figure out, well, how do we reel that back in? Well, we showed what we did on this project because we couldn't quite decide what we wanted to do, and the hospital was really the client and so they needed to be part of this decision making. We pitched them what we kind of dubbed a sushi menu of things. It's like, do you like popping bubbles with Ariel? Do you like Rafiki's markings? Do you like this and that? And listed everything out. They only cut one thing. So because of that, they came to the table with more money and fixed that delta and basically doubled what our budget was and achieved out there but they had to come to the table with that difference just because of what the donation already was. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about Martin Sklar's uh, kind of philosophy of creating the lead, and to what point the process, does that normally get developed for you guys to start with the lead and build around it, or do you kind of discover what that is uh, as the project begins to evolve? Um, so the question is kind of how do we discover kind of how it all comes together as a story and experience? Yeah, you were, you were talking about creating that key weave element that kind of is going to draw 
Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. The weenie. So, so the, not weave. yeah, not weave. It's like a hot dog weenie, basically. Like your weenie to kind of draw you down is what it was. Um, so the question is, how do we know what that was? <laughs> That's okay. Um, and this one though is because of space, you come to it in a couple different, and from two different directions. We couldn't really, we didn't have necessarily one focal point, um, but it was really how do we integrate all those together, and then that visual connection. So that was what, yeah, it's weenie. <laughs> Yeah. So how often do we have to change our items and projects because of budgets or different constraints? Uh, it is a constant thing that's with us. I mean, we joke change is constant, um, and it is always happening. We have, just like this project for any of them, kind of a target investment of what we're working towards and always kind of shooting for as, as much as we can get. I think that's inherent in so many different in creative people and in our blue sky group of we want more, we want this, we want bigger, and we're trying to push ourselves for that. Um, and then it's really starting to work with, we have a whole estimating team that has decades of experience and past to kind of know this is X amount of dollars, this is that. And we do have to make those sacrifices of cutting things and what it would be. So. There's no set process, but it happens on every project and doing it right now with projects. And it's stuff that you can never get married to anything. Um, I'm trying to remember one of our guys uh, jokes about like the kitten in the box as an analogy. It's like you have to be willing to get rid of this like perfect cute little thing and just like, nope, done. Because you can't have it all always. And so you're like, but I want that. I want the little cute kitten. He's like, sorry, don't get it. So you have to be willing to change and just move forward and not get so married and t tied to one idea, yeah, which is hard, very hard. <laughs> is there, yeah. Yeah, so what type of things do we look for in resumes, portfolios for people potentially coming into the company? Um, I'll say it varies greatly because we have over 140 different disciplines within Imagineering. So it can range from graphic design, show writer, to estimators and schedulers, to project managers. So it really can vary greatly. I think one of the things that you'll see in some of our kind of official books, and it will sound like a cliche when I say it, but it's true, it's be passionate about something, but also, um, I'm gonna contradict myself when I say this a little bit. We have sub subject matter experts, people that all they know is projection systems and how a projector works from IMAX down to a tiny little thing that fits in Madame Leota's head and is battery powered, but that's all they do. But we also have people that are really kind of just general knowledge and can know a little bit of everything and help pull this stuff together. So we always are trying to have that balance. I'm more on probably the general knowledge a little know enough of everything to keep going, but I can't tell you what the throw on a projector is and where you have to do it. That's why we have someone else to do it. Um, but I think it's that kind of passion, excitement for stuff um, in general is a big thing. So, okay, one more question here. Are there any hidden Mickeys in the space at all? Uh, no hidden Mickeys in this space. I will say, um, personally, and this might be a little controversial when I say this to some people, not a huge fan of Hidden Mickeys. Um, the reason for that, for those of you guys that maybe don't know, is Hidden Mickeys, you, a lot of times it's been this thing where people put this little silhouette of the Mickey in his ears into different stuff. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to create these environments and stories and set you in a time and a place, and then it turns into, where's the Hidden Mickey? Well, you're supposed to be riding through 18th century haunted mansion in upstate New York, and now you're trying to find Mickey so what's that balance? So we've done some other things where it's hidden references that fit in the story. So at Big Thunder, we put references to original creator of Big Thunder or the original concept art. So it stays within that story a little bit, but it's not kind of a th sore thumb. But I get both sides. <laughs> yeah. One more. Yeah, sorry. 
Hi. Um, so I know that obviously with any project you're doing for Imagineering, it needs to be on brand, it needs to be focused. Um, and I'm wondering how much of your influence personally comes from other attractions, spaces, or Disney properties, and then how much external inspiration feeds into that and how that comes into like making that on brand but really engaging yeah. and exciting experience. So question is how do we integrate both keeping on brand with Disney and kind of what people come to expect with that with an outside influences, both personal and kind of trends that are happening. Um, for me personally, it is, again, being kind of out there. I'm a news junkie myself. I'm always reading like CNN.com or to BuzzFeed or whatever and finding out what's happening, what's going on, to then just think like, oh, cool, there's plants that people are now able to make bioluminescence just on their own. Like I was reading that one yesterday. So then it's like, well, can that work for Avatar that we're building in Animal Kingdom? So then that starts to influence and it works for that story. Um, so that's one thing, but it is trying to be Disney, which sometimes can feel a little limiting because you think this is what Disney is. But when you back up and look at the brand, it's very wide and broad. When you, to the to extent, it's still, it's really about kind of quality and what's that experience and family and all that. But if you look at the history, especially 80s and 90s, it varied wildly, maybe swung back a little bit more traditional, if you will, now. But um, we do use a lot of outside influences. Downtown Disney and Disney Springs right now is heavily influenced by outside stuff, in part because it's outside um, operating participants who come in. But we're still looking at, you're going to bring in a participant who is appropriate for the bigger Disney family vacation experience. Um, so we have to balance both of those together. But I know part of it for me is just always being out there looking at stuff and thinking what could work with it. Yeah.